We're so glad that you found this Peak City message today. Our prayer is that during our time together, you're able to discover Jesus and are encouraged to follow him fearlessly. If you're new to faith, if you're new to church, if you're not familiar with the Bible, all of it, you're just figuring it out. I think you're in the best church uh, that you could ever find uh, because we help people discover Jesus every single week. But also, I love it because it's a church that, man, if you have been following Jesus for a long time, if you grew up in church, man, this is such a beautiful place for you to be able to come and to worship God and to love him with everything you've got. And you can invite your friends and know that it's not going to be a freaking weird experience for them. And so that's a, that's a really freeing thing, man. And so, yes, we exist to reach people far from God like me that didn't grow up in church. And we exist to help people who do love God, man, love him freely and be on mission uh, with him. And so that's what's happening here at Peak City. And man, today I'm so pumped that you're here because it is heart for the house Sunday, all right? We are going to talk about some exciting things today. Um, and uh, what, what, what this whole um, heart for the house initiative is, uh, we're wrapping it up today. Um, we've been talking about this for about a month is that we've been asking everybody that calls Peak City home to consider um, praying about your monthly financial commitment to this church. And we're going to wrap it up today. Now, I know some of y'all here for the first time, you're like, oh, crap, I came on the week they talking about money. Are you serious right now? And uh, I'm telling you, you're here on the right Sunday because I believe with all of my heart um, that God can change your life today. Um, we actually had it happen last service. It was the most peak city thing that has ever happened that on a Sunday where we're talking about money, we had someone raise their hand and give their life to Jesus and decide to become a Christian in the midst of all this. I ain't ever heard a more peak city story than that. Um, because I'm telling you, uh, when, when we talk about money and the financial health of our church and where are we going as a church and all that, um, there's nothing to hide. Right, like I'm, I've been praying like crazy that you would just, uh, that your confidence and your trust in the church would grow uh, as a result of, of this Sunday because I'm just gonna be all cards on the table. Here's where we are, here's where we've been and here's where we're going. And um, I think that if you're skeptical of church and faith, I think this is gonna be powerful for you. Um, not only that, not only are we gonna talk about the financial health of the church, but don't, don't mistake it. We still gonna preach Jesus. <laughs> we are still going to dig into the life of Jesus. And, and I still believe with all of my heart that the, that the message that God has put on my heart to share with you, it can change your life. It can, it can lead some of you who have maybe uh, been considering faith to finally take that step and start following Jesus. And so, uh, man, I'm pumped in so many ways for today and I can't wait to dig into it with you. And so if you got a Bible, go ahead and get to uh, John chapter eight. John chapter 8 is where we're going to be. Uh, the title of my message for you today is Freedom is Worth Everything. Freedom is Worth Everything. I want you to write that phrase down. If you've got a, a, f the notes app in your phone, type it out. I want you to be praying on this phrase all week long that freedom is worth everything. And I'm praying that by the end of our time together, you'll believe it. And, uh, and that we'll start to act on it together as a church family. All right, we in John chapter eight. Uh, if you're with us online, shout out to you. Love you guys. Can't wait to see you in person. If you've been tracking with us, we've been preaching through the book of John off and on for almost a year now. And I plotted it out the other day. We should wrap it up on Easter Sunday of 2024. <laughs> so we're going to be in it for a while. All right, that's going to be great. But uh, we in John chapter eight and we're in verse 12. We're actually going to read a lot from John eight today. Um, but I want you to see that John chapter 8 is a season where Jesus uh, is going to be very clear, very direct, and very confrontational about something that you and I need to know. All right, there are seasons in the ministry of Jesus when he kind of soft played it. There are seasons in the ministry of Jesus when he laid the groundwork. And then there are seasons when he was very direct and very clear. And I want you to see in John chapter 8 that this is a time when he is very clear and very bold. It says in verse 12. Y'all ready for this? Okay. Do you actually believe that God can change your life today? Okay. Seven people believe it. The rest of y'all are like, I don't know if I believe it yet. That's all right. You don't have to believe it. I believe it. And there's some other people in this room that believe it. And our faith is enough for you. You can borrow our faith, man. Um, I've seen, I'm telling you, last service, I thought, this is not the, the notes, I don't care, man. It's, it's 11 o'clock service, man. I can go as long as I want. There ain't no service coming after us. Just so you know, we don't, we don't go that long. Our service is like an hour long, so don't, don't get nervous. But last service, I thought, there's no way. I mean, I've been praying all week that somebody would give their life to Jesus. And last service, I was like, there ain't no way on, on a Sunday I'm talking about money. Somebody going to give their life to Jesus. 
And some person in the back put their hand up and said, yep, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm like, man, I, if, if God can change a life on a Sunday when we talk about the financial health of the church, he can do anything in your life. Um, so just open your heart and get ready. Let's do this. John chapter 8, verse 12. It says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now pause there for a second. This is like one of the most hallmark card verses in all of the New Testament. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. It sounds so cute. It sounds so sweet. It sounds so quaint. Your granny probably got this stitched on a pillow in her house right now. I am the light of the world. It sounds so sweet. And yet when Jesus preached it, it was wildly offensive to everyone who heard it. Jesus preached this verse in the midst of the Festival of Tabernacles. And, and what would happen in the Festival of Tabernacles, this, this religious festival that people would gather from all over for, is that they would light these four large candlesticks. And, and they would have them on poles, at, at, and, and these poles would stretch really high in the air, and they put these bowls over top of the candlesticks so that when people looked in the darkness, they saw this bright, bright light. It almost looked like a pillar of light, which was supposed to symbolize how God appeared to the Israelites in the book of Exodus. A pillar of fire at night would lead them through their exile. And so they would gather together and, and, and during this festival of tabernacles, they would sing their worship up in the, in, in, in the darkness, but towards these, these lights. And Jesus comes along <laughs> and he says, I am the light of the world. The thing you're singing to, <laughs> it's me. The thing, the, the one you're worshiping, it's me. I am the light that you're singing to. And if you'll follow me, you'll never be in darkness again. And, and we, we, we read it and we hear Hallmark card. We hear cute little pillow at granny's house. When they heard it, it was wildly offensive. And every Jewish jaw would have been dropped to the floor when a man claimed to be the one that they were worshiping. And is it, as if that weren't offensive enough, he just keeps going. In the next verse, it says the Pharisees challenged him, here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. And Jesus answered, he's about to go all in. He says, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I come from and where I'm going. You ain't got no idea where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true. Catch this. Because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. Well, here's the deal. I am one who testifies for myself, but my other witness is your heavenly Father who sent me. Then they asked him, where is your Father? He said, y'all, you don't know me or my Father, Jesus replied, because if you knew me, you would know my father also. Do you see what he is saying? If you knew God, you'd know me. <laughs> if you knew your heavenly father, you'd know me because he sent me and he is with me and he has not left me. And, and as if that wasn't offensive enough, man, he just keeps going. Down in verse 23, it says, but he continued, you're from below. I'm from above. I'm telling you, he gets so direct here. You're from below, I'm from above. You're of this world, I'm not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you don't believe that I am he. He ain't messing around. <laughs> this is not a time to, to lay the groundwork anymore. He's ready to go in. He's being direct. He says that I am he. You will indeed die in your sins if you don't believe that I am he. When you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and I do nothing on my own, but I speak just what the father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone for I always do what pleases him. Can you see what he is saying? Can you see the direct clarity that he is providing on his own identity? And as if that weren't enough, he then caps it all off with the most offensive phrase, the most offensive line that any Jewish man or woman could ever hear. In verse 58, he says, very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, if you ain't familiar with the, with the Bible, you don't know why that's offensive. But if you read the book of Genesis, you see that God revealed himself in a burning bush to a man named Moses, and he declared that his name is, I am. And Jesus says, 
before Abraham was even born, before your ancestors were even around. They looked to me before Abraham even was, I am. I want you to understand and make no mistake about it. Jesus is done laying the groundwork. He's done beating around the bush. He's done just, you know, kind of feeling things out. He says, let me declare the truth that you've always needed to know. The truth that actually what we're going to learn will set you free. And it is this, Jesus is God. Jesus, let me say it again for you, is God. Jesus was not just a good teacher. Jesus was not just a good preacher. He was not just a good counselor. He was not just a good source of wisdom. In John chapter eight, Jesus says, it's time for me to just get real with you. It's time for me to tell you what's really going down. It's time for you to embrace the reality that Jesus is God. And in John eight, he makes it as clear as day. Now, while many were offended, and many could not believe he was saying this. I mean, it, jaws were on the floor. There were also many who actually heard it and believed. There were many who, when they heard it, their hearts skipped a beat because they knew, they knew, they knew. They knew that God had trying to, been trying to get through to them for years. They knew, they knew in their mind that it was true. They could just, they, they had something inside. They, they knew, it says in verse 30, it says, even as he spoke, many believed in him. And to those who believed in him, which I believe many of you right now, are hearing this, if you're watching online, maybe you're feeling the same way. Maybe right now, when I said the words, Jesus is God, something happened in your soul. Something happened in here because you know it's true. And for those who believed in him, Jesus says this. He says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then here it is, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so if the son sets you free, you will be free Indeed, Jesus says this, this cosmological truth, it is the truest thing you could ever hear. It's the truest thing you could ever receive. It's the truest thing you could ever reorient your life around that Jesus is God. And if you will reorient your life around this truth, if you will embrace it, if you will receive it, you will step into freedom. It's the freest life, it's not the easiest life, it's the freest life you will ever experience is when you live your life under the truth that Jesus is God. I want you to see what's happening in John chapter 8. Okay, I want you to see what's happening in John chapter 8. I need you to go, I, I, I need you to not uh, check out because we're going deeper into the Bible today than, than, than usual. I want you to not check out. I want you to see what's happening in John chapter 8, okay? If you've been tracking with us, John 1 through 7, Jesus, there have been times when Jesus would heal somebody and then they'd go, oh man, I'm gonna go tell everybody, right? And Jesus goes, shh, 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 don't tell anybody. Not yet. My time has not, not come yet. There'd be times when they would ask him questions like, who are you? And he was kind of coy about it, right? He would kind of like dance around the topic a little bit and kind of give him something to think on and chew on. And then all of a sudden in John 8, he's like, no, I am God. Let's just be clear about it, okay? I want you to see John chapter 8 is a season, okay, it's a season. Jesus often talked about ministry in seasons. There are seasons for planting, there are seasons for watering, there are seasons for waiting, and there are seasons, there are seasons for harvesting and reaping. And John chapter eight is a season of reaping. It's a season where you need to catch this, and this happens from time to time, and Jesus is in it right now. But a bold declaration of Jesus in certain seasons leads to freedom. A bold declaration of Jesus leads to freedom. Jesus stood up and said, no more messing around, I am God. And people believed it and they stepped into freedom. Okay, it's a season, it's a season where a bold declaration of Jesus leads to freedom. Peak City, I want you to understand this. I believe with everything that I have that we are in that season right now. I believe that what we are experiencing together is a season where groundwork has been laid and now it's time for a bold declaration of Jesus and when it happens, it's leading to freedom. And I believe that for a few reasons, okay? I believe it for a few reasons. One, I believe it because of our culture. Our culture right now <clears throat> is more confused than it's ever been. Our culture is more confused about everything we're confused about the economy. 
we're confused about the workforce. We're confused about politics. We're confused about gender. We're confused about sexuality. We're confused about religion. We're confused about spirituality. We're confused about basically everything. And I don't mean this to say, oh my gosh, we've all gone so liberal. No, actually, what's interesting is if you go 20 years ago, when I was in Bible college and seminary, all the classes I was taking and all the sociologists that we were studying were saying, hey, if you're, if you're going to be a pastor, buckle up and get ready because America 20 years from now will be like post-Christian Europe. This was the main thought, the main projection for our country was that 20 years forward now, that we would be like post-Christian Europe, that we would all be incredibly liberal progressive, that we would all be atheists, that churches would all be dead, and that no one in our country would have any interest in spirituality. Well, fast forward 20 years from that, and they were wrong. That's not America today. America is not post-Christian Europe. It's really, really confused. Because while they're like, is the church dying? I mean, yeah, some churches are for sure. <laughs> I know churches shutting their doors every week. I got too many pastor friends that have shut their doors over the past 12 to 18 months. Absolutely. Churches are dying, but not all churches. There are some churches that are growing like a weed. You're sitting in one of them right now. There's some churches across the country that are seeing record attendance all over the board. Churches ain't, no, no. Some churches are dying, but not all churches are dying. Uh, has, has America gone incredibly liberal? Yeah, I mean, there's liberal people. There's also a lot of conservative people. I mean, you know, like our nation's more divided politically than ever. And it's not, you can't even make sense of it. You know, I got friends, I got friends that represent a, a whole crew, a whole demographic who don't believe in Jesus, comma, and they think pornography is wrong and the sexual revolution has led us astray, but it has nothing to do with Jesus. <laughs> It's like nobody fits in these nice, neat, clean categories. We are confused. We don't know which way is up. We don't know which way is down. America is actually still interested in religion and still interested in spirituality. It's just taken on all kinds of different forms and functions. It's a very, very confused group. And, and that's why I say, that's why I say, in a culture that is confused, that no sociologist can predict what's needed, a bold declaration of Jesus that leads to freedom. When no one knows which way to turn, when no one knows which way is up, when no one knows which way is down, when no one can trust the news, when no one can trust the media, what's needed? The way, the truth, and the life that has been providing a, a way of peace and love for 2,000 years. A bold declaration of Jesus leads to freedom. I believe it because of our culture. But more than that, more than just our culture, I believe that what is needed right now is a bold declaration of Jesus that leads to freedom. And, and some of you have maybe noticed, I've actually had several of you come up to me and say, PD, I've noticed you've like changed in your preaching over the past like year and a half or two. Like you've, you've shifted, you've changed, like you're, you're way more like bold and confrontational and like, and like we gotta say it, we gotta mean it, right? And, and I don't think I've changed, I don't think. I've been, I feel like I've been preaching the same way. However, all I know is that when I get bold about Jesus and when we, when, when we don't mess around about it, when I just lay the challenge out to you of who Jesus is, you know what I see? I see freedom. I believe that this, I believe we're in a John 8 season where a bold declaration of Jesus is what's gonna lead to freedom. I believe it because of what I have seen and I have seen too much, okay? I wrote down some things that I have seen and I wanna read them to you. And uh, I have seen these things like recently. This isn't like years ago, four score and seven years ago. This is like last week. Last week, I, I've seen the bold declaration of Jesus give a young single mom last week who came up to me in the lobby. A young single mom, she was given the power to endure through a custody battle and come out on the other side with both her kids and her faith stronger than ever. I've seen the bold declaration of Jesus give a young couple freedom through regret, guilt, and shame that came after an abortion. I've seen the bold declaration of Jesus set young men and women free from addictions to porn. I've seen the bold declaration of Jesus restore a marriage that four months ago, I was praying with the husband right here, and last week I, last week I hugged he and his wife because they're together and on the road to recovery. 
Now, I've seen the bold declaration of Jesus lead wealthy families to sacrifice their resources in such a wild way that it helped our church not just survive a pandemic, but thrive in the midst of it and come out reaching people like never before. I've seen the bold declaration of Jesus lead people to confess sins that have had them under the, the, the weight of guilt and shame for decades and now they are free. I've seen the bold declaration of Jesus lead to a husband and wife in the same service, all right? They were sitting right next to each other. We said, stand up, we're gonna respond to God. Everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. Privacy for everybody. If you wanna become a Christian, raise your hand on the count of three. And I saw a husband and wife raise their hands unknowing that the other was doing the same. And they didn't know it, but in an instant, their marriage and their family tree was forever changed. I've seen the bold declaration of Jesus lead atheists, agnostics, Muslims, Mormons, alcoholics, workaholics, drug dealers, pill poppers, men, women, gay, straight, young, old, black, white, brown, rich, poor, Democrat, Republican, and everyone in between all those categories. I've seen the bold declaration of Jesus lead people in all of those categories to freedom. I have seen it. I've seen too much. I'm not guessing that this is where we are, I know it. How long it lasts, I don't know, but we're in it. And, and here's the deal, it ain't just me. <laughs> it ain't just like what I've learned and observed, it's not just what I've seen. I want you to know that we're in that season, I want you to feel it, I want you to embrace it, that a bold declaration of Jesus that, that leads to freedom, it's happening not just because of what I see, but because of what you have experienced. It's because of what you have experienced, okay? I texted our whole church this past week and I said, hey, I want you to text me and answer this question. How has following Jesus led you to experience more freedom? And I want you to hear what came from the people sitting next to you. I want you to hear from the people that sit in your rows right now. Here's what they said, it'll be on the screen for you. Jesus has freed me from insecurity. His love is enough for me. He's freed me by helping me let go of guilt. Now I'm free to focus on loving others instead of being buried in self-hatred. He's freed me from my heroin addiction. Following Jesus freed me from being a workaholic. He's given me hope for the future. Following Jesus has made me more productive and confident. I'm free from what I can't control. I'm free from fear of the future. My husband and I were both freed from sexual sin in our dating relationship and we've entered into marriage knowing that we can overcome our temptations. I feel so free knowing that when I do make a mistake, I'm forgiven and loved no matter what. I'm now free from the grudges I've held against people my entire life. Jesus has helped me not to feel alone in my grief. I'm now free to give myself grace and be patient while he grows me. Jesus has helped me experience freedom and healing from trauma in an abusive relationship. I feel a freedom in decision making knowing that God's with me every step of the way. Because of Jesus, I'm free from myself, my ego, my own judgment and condemnation. This last one's a long one, but I wanted it up there because it's so powerful. She says, growing up, I struggled a lot with depression and anxiety, especially throughout high school and after losing my best friend to suicide in 2019. I let anxiety, depression, and anger define me. I wasn't a happy person. And if I would feel happy, it was actually uncomfortable and I would slip back into the comfort of anxiety and depression as weird as that may sound. That's actually not weird if any of you have been through anxiety and depression, you know exactly what that feels like. It's actually sometimes way more comfortable to slip back into it and to not feel happy. She said, but through a mentor and my husband who helped me get to Jesus and see how loved I am, I realize that these mental illnesses don't define me. Jesus defines me and he calls me chosen and wanted and his, Jesus is pure love and joy. And now I can say I walk with freedom from these things every single day, because Jesus has showed me freedom. God is incredible. And I just want so many more people to experience the freedom that I now have. That's who's sitting in your rows right now. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. And um, I don't know about you, but when I read those, I want to keep going. I want to keep going. I have no desire to stop. There are too many more people who are um, trapped by the lies of the enemy. There are too many people in our city who are hopeless. There are too many people in our city who are thinking about suicide right now. There are too many people 
that still need to experience the freedom that is only found when they will embrace the truth that Jesus is God. They, they need to hear a bold declaration of Jesus that will set them free. They need to hear it from you in, 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 in one-on-one conversations. They need, to, they need to hear it at church. They need to be surrounded by it. I'm just not ready to be done, man. I know we've grown. Yeah, we've grown. That's great. Parking lot's more full. Yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. Man, we ain't even, I'm not even close to being done. We should, need, we, we should be so ready to reach so many more people. I want more people to experience freedom. But, all right, but you need to know, freedom comes with a cost. All right, freedom comes with a cost. Now, <clears throat> we're going to have an adult conversation right now, okay? We're going to talk about money. Because nobody likes to talk about money in the church. But here's the truth, all right? If you, don't, if, you, if you think the church shouldn't be run like a business, if you think there's no business aspect to church, that's cool. If you don't want to talk about money in church, that's cool. Just plug your ears for the next like 10 minutes and go la, 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 la. And the adults will have a conversation. The rest of us will talk. Because <laughs> here's the deal. When the bank comes calling for the mortgage payment every month, they don't accept saved souls as payment. They need money. The credit card, <laughs> credit card company don't ever ask me how many people raise their hand this week. They don't care. <laughs> okay, they just need money. <laughs> and so we got to talk about money. We're going we're gonna to do this. And, and, and I don't care. I, I'm actually so proud to talk about where we are uh, as a church financially. And so what I want to do for the next little bit is I just want to real talk with you. All cards on the table. I want to show you where we were as a church financially, where we are, and where we're going. Very simple. Where we were, where we are where we're going, and then I'll let you decide what to do with that, okay? Where we were. If you've been around this church for a while, you've heard this story multiple times, so uh, you just buckle up and enjoy it again because it's a beautiful story. If you haven't been here for long, uh, this, story, this story will probably shock you. Um, uh, when I got here uh, nearly four years ago, um, our church was in a, in, a, in a rough spot, okay? We were about half the size that we are right now, but way, way more important than that is that we only had about two weeks, I repeat, two weeks, worth of expenses saved up in the bank. For those of you that don't know, that's bad. <laughs> that's bad, okay, bad, bad. Um, on top of that, you need to know that we were in a facility that served us really well for, for several years, but we were in an escalating lease, and we were also, that, that facility was in the basement of a U-Haul building, and that basement of the U-Haul building was costing us $35,000 a month in rent. Um, it, it was really, really expensive, with only having two weeks worth of expenses in the bank. And so when I showed up, um, I and our, our elder team, our board of directors, um, we knew like, man, this is tough, but if we can afford $35,000 a month, my brain was clicking. I'm like, man, if we can afford this much per month, we could afford a mortgage. <laughs> like we can own our home if we can afford a $35,000 a month a rent, a rent payment. So, so I'm like, okay, we can afford a mortgage. The problem is we don't have a down payment. And so if you're with us, we went through this crazy thing where like I get here three months later, COVID hits and the whole world is shut down. We're paying $35,000 a month for a facility that we can't even meet in. It was insane. And so we gathered everyone in the midst of COVID. And, um, and by everyone, at that point, there was only like a hundred of us left. Some of y'all were at that meeting. It was like the few, the proud, the Marines were in the room. And uh, I said what was probably the dumbest craziest thing that I've said in my entire life. I said, I feel like God's calling us to buy 1710 Dublin Boulevard, the building you're in now, but it's going to require us because we don't have any money in the bank. It's going to require us to raise $2 million in 60 days. And everyone laughed. <laughs> it's like, that's not an encouraging first step. <laughs> I'm going to need you to take this seriously. <laughs> but by the grace of God and the miraculous generosity of our people, we were able to raise $2 million in 60 days and paved the way for us to be in this building today. It's insane. It's the craziest story that I've ever experienced in my life of following Jesus. And so we broke ground on this building and we opened this building just a little over two years ago. But you need to know that when we broke ground on this building, the story didn't end because the bank saw that we were such a young, fledgling church without much financial security. And so yes, they would loan us this money with that down payment, but they put another stipulation on it. We had to pay off another $500,000 on this building in the first 18 months that we were here. They wanted to see that we were still serious about growing and reaching people and that we were all serious about owning this, this home and making it ours and giving generously. 
And so we raised the $2 million, but then we had to raise on top of all of our operating expenses another $500,000. And so for the next 18 months, the first year and a half we were in this building, we're reaching people for Jesus, and we've got this huge burden on our back of another half a million dollars we got to get to the bank. And it's been, it's been hard. And so last September, I finally got the call from the bank that said, Petey, you did it. The church did it. You've paid down the $500,000, nothing left to pay, which is great because of the generosity of our people. And oh, by the way, our mortgage is on this building is $32,000 a month versus $35,000 a month in rent. That's, that was the vision all along that we, if we can, now we have this beautiful building that we can reach even more people and we can grow and we're actually paying less here than we were there. It, it's, it's beautiful. But now do you see why I needed therapy? Lord have mercy, for those keeping track, there were two weeks of expenses. We raised $2 million, we gave it all to the bank. Then we raised $500,000 and we gave it all to the bank. And that's why I'm a psycho! <laughs> that's why my poor wife has had to endure for two years. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget when I got that call from the bank saying, you did it, like you don't need to raise any more money, just pay your monthly mortgage, it's all good. I got that call and I was in my bedroom when I got it and I crumbled to the floor. Because it, it was just like a sand, I mean, I got, like a sandbag I'd had on my shoulders and I didn't even know it was there. And all of a sudden they said, you're good. And it was like, I felt like, oh my God. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. We did. Like, I, I didn't even know the pressure that came with that. And there's some people in this room that know that pressure. It's hard, but we did it. And we survived it. And if you were a part of that, if you've been around this church for a while and you helped us accomplish that, you should feel so dang proud of where we are. We have survived one of the most challenging times where so many churches shut their doors and the people of this church gave faithfully and consistently and generously and it paved the way for us to be where we are today. It's beautiful, it's beautiful, right? That's where, that's where we were. That's why I've been in therapy, okay? Where we are, okay, where we are. <clears throat> we are in a better position than we've ever been before. We, we don't have two weeks of expenses in the bank now. We have two months, okay? Two months is progress. We have two months worth of expenses in the bank. We're, we're, we're giving generously. We're, we're growing, right? Things are going great. I, I want to share some stats with you. Again, all cards on the table. I, don't want, I, I want you to, to trust what's happening here, so I'm just going to share stats with you. Our budget right now, um, our budget that's devoted to staff, staff salaries is 35%. 35% of our budget is staffing. Most churches our size are at 60%, okay? I want you to know that's how lean our staff is running because we're doing everything we can to make sure this church is financially healthy and we reach as many people as we possibly can, okay? You should be proud of that. It's a, I, I just met with a pastor this week church, and, and, and his, his church is the same size as ours, okay? And they've got about four times as many staff members as we do. Okay, our church is a lean, mean fighting machine. It's healthy, it's growing, we're growing like crazy. I mean, right now, guys, come on. We're, reach, we're, we're growing 30% a year right now. Now, last year when we opened the building, it's natural to see a 30% growth in one year when you open a brand new building. What isn't natural is in year two to see another 30%. We just keep growing, clip year after year, it's, it's crazy. Now, all that's amazing, it's great. The concerning to share with you is that we're 30% a year right now. Giving is only growing about 10% a year. So you can see that that's a gap. And if we don't close that gap, at the point where rubber meets the road, we will be prevented from doing great ministry, right? And so we got to figure that out. That's, that's where we're at. We're in a, we're a stronger place than we've ever been. But when you compare it to where we've been, it's like, yeah, anything more than that. <laughs> like the up and down, we're getting stable and steady. And that's thanks to the generosity of our people, okay? Now, that's where we are. Where are we going? I got two big things with you about where we're going, and um, I hope that it gives you a, a peace and trust in the direction we're going. Number one, um, and it's all about finances, okay? Number one, um, we are, uh, the goal we've set is four to six months of savings in an emergency fund, okay? If you don't know, if, if, if you're struggling financially, that's just like basic. If COVID taught us anything, we need to be prepared for anything. Okay, so we're working towards getting this, this emergency fund set up so that our church, again, is just stable and can keep reaching people for decades to come. We're doing all this on top of still doing ministry, by the way. 
We're still giving to our local partners. We're still funding great ministry. We're still helping out all kinds of people. But we're working towards this. The, 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 the second thing that I really want you to hear that I think God um, is asking of us right now is that I believe he wants us to prepare for future growth and expansion. Okay, 30% of your growth. I don't know if it's going to keep happening, but if it does, we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. You need to understand, you are sitting right now in the dream that about 80 or 100 people had three years ago. You're, three years ago, 80 to 100 people gathered in a, in a small room and said, man, wouldn't it be awesome if we could like own our first church home and it could be like filled with people and we see baptisms all the time and the parking lot's full and the room is filled and we're reaching young people. Wouldn't that be awesome? And like, yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome. Well, if, if we're going to get there, we got to give now, right? And so we're living right now in the dream that 80 or 100 people had three years ago. It, you're here because of their generosity. Now, transition that to now. The thousand plus people that attend this church every week, we need to be prepared for the dreams that God is going to give us in the next three to four years. We need to be ready to say yes. We need to be ready. When, when God asks us to go to that foreign country and partner with that local missionary that's already on the ground, reaching an unreached people group, and he asks us to send people and to send teams and to send money, we need to be ready to say yes. When God asks us to go start a community center here in Colorado Springs that serves uh, impoverished families, my gosh, we need to say yes immediately and we need to be ready for it. Right? When God calls us to start a third service, a fourth service, a fifth service, because we're going to keep maxing this building out, we need to be ready to say yes to it. When God calls us to start Peak City Leadership College and raise up young leaders and send them out to churches and send them out to the marketplace, we need to be ready to say yes. When God asks us to start another Peak City location 20 minutes away, because there are houses going up left and right in this city and very few churches are expanding, most churches are shutting their doors down. When God asks us to go, we need to be ready to say yes. I don't want to say no to God ever. When he says jump, we want to say how high. We want to go. And, but I'm telling you, those dreams, those dreams do not get accomplished without our generosity. And I say ours because my wife and I are in it with you. Our staff is in it with you. Everyone that, that, that works at this church, that receives a salary from this church, gives back to this church. We would never ask you to do something that we don't do. We will always smoke what we sell. That line always lightens the mood just a touch. It won't happen. I mean, come on, growth requires generosity. Let's get real. Let's be adults here. This stuff don't happen for free. Growth requires generosity. And so at this point, you know, as I was prepping this message for you, I was like, all right, all right, God, here we go. Now what am I going to say to him? All right, we all know we want to set people free. We all know we're all ready. So, so what do we say now? And I was like, all right, man, I could, I could preach a little mini message on tithing to you, right? Because we need to make tithing sexy again. We need, we need to bring sexy back to tithing. Because you know that the church for 2,000 years has been built on families who will give 10% of what they make back to the church. To, to fund the mission of God. The church had been built for 2,000 years on that. But nah, that, I, I knew that wasn't what I needed to preach. And then I thought, man, I, I, I could preach a message on first fruits, the biblical teaching of first fruits, that you ought to give your first fruits back to God, the best of what you, of, of what you make, the first, not the leftovers, not whatever's left over the month. You should actually give the, of your first fruits to God. And I was like, nah, one day, one day I'll preach that because that is a biblical message. I thought, man, I could, I could preach about the number of times Jesus spoke about money. And you know, he spoke about money all the time. You know why he spoke about it all the time? Because you and I think about it all the time. And Jesus didn't want anything from you. He actually wanted something for you. He wanted to free your heart from the grips of greed. And generosity does it. But that, that, that wasn't what God wanted me to say to you. And the more I prayed about it, I felt like God just wanted me to ask you a question. It's a very simple question. And it's this. What is freedom worth? What's freedom worth? And I can't answer that question for you. I think that's, that's, why, I think that's why it's such a beautiful question. What's freedom worth? Because like, here's the deal, when, when that question, and you, you ponder that question, um, the dollar amount actually doesn't matter. You know, the dollar amount, God actually doesn't, doesn't really care about. 
It's at, like if someone gives $10 or someone gives $1,000 or someone gives $10,000. You know right now there are young adults in our church that give faithfully. There are people in this church that are barely 20 years old who are giving faithfully and they're giving a large percentage of what they make, but it don't add up to nothing compared to what some of y'all give, but their sacrifice is actually bigger than yours. The, 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 that's why I love this question because the dollar amount, that's for you to decide, man. That's between you and God. I ain't never gonna tell you you should give this amount of money. I ain't never gonna tell you you should give this amount of percent to God. Man, that's between you and God. Don't give because I pressure you into it. Don't give out of guilt. No, no, no. Go to God and say, God, what's freedom worth? What's freedom worth? And whatever you and God decide, go for it, man. That's between you and God. That's between you and God. You know, when, when our staff comes in every day for work throughout the week, we pass by these two panels on our, um, on our wall. And actually, you could, you could take a little field trip after service and go see them. If you take a right out the doors, they're right down here by our back doors. We pass by these panels every single day. And these two panels are the signatures of everyone who has been baptized at this church since we opened it two years ago. Okay, a full panel already and we got panel number two ready, right? These are all the people that have stepped into freedom, that have said, I believe Jesus is God and I'm ready to give my life to him and I'm ready to surrender to him. I'm ready to follow him for the rest of my days and they are experiencing freedom like they have never experienced before. And I just believe at some point someday that we're gonna line the halls of this church with those panels. I think that will be what you walk down kids ministry to see, what you see all over the lobby and people are gonna walk in and on their first Sunday at Peak City, they're gonna go, hey, what's, what's with all the panels? Can I sign one? And we'll say, yeah, when you're ready. When you're ready to step into freedom. That's what these panels are. It's all the people who've experienced freedom. So man, what's freedom worth to you? I, I, I think some of y'all in this church are gonna be compelled to give for the very first time and man, $100 a month is huge to you and that's great, man. It's huge to God. But I hate setting a dollar amount on this up because those panels are worth all the money in the world. The souls that those represent, some people in this church can give $10,000 a month and it, it, it wouldn't hurt you a bit. And some of you are like, dang, I'm like, yeah. Because there are poor, middle-class and wealthy people in this church. There are black, white, and brown. There are young and old. There's, it's for everyone everywhere. And so I ain't gonna put a dollar amount on, that's between you and God. You should go to God and ask that question, what's freedom worth, and, and, but, but you should know. As you ask it, you need to know what Jesus' answer was. Because Jesus' answer to the question, what's freedom worth? is very easy. When he thought about you and he thought about your freedom, Jesus' answer is that freedom is worth everything. Freedom is worth everything. Freedom is worth so much that he would willingly stretch his arms out on the cross to die for you knowing everything about you, knowing you at your absolute worst. And he says, I'll stretch out my arms. I'll give up everything for you. Your freedom is worth everything. I love how Paul writes it in Colossians. Go ahead and put that verse up for us, please. It says, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. And here it is, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. When Jesus stretched his arms on the cross, it was to buy your freedom it was the payment that, that, that had to be made on your behalf. And so in response to that, I believe Jesus wants some of you to say, all right, Jesus, I'm, you're not calling me to stretch my arms out on a cross right now, but Jesus, I will live my life in such a way that says freedom is worth everything. I will give of my time. I will give of my resources. I will give of my energy. I'll do whatever it takes to help as many people experience freedom as possible. And I wanna give you a chance to make that decision today. Um, some of you, it's, it's going to be a, a first time decision. Some of you, on the day we talk about financial health, you just learned that God knows everything about you and he loves you. And it's time for you to start following him. Others of you, it's time for you to, to get serious about your commitment to God and how much freedom is worth to you. So I want to give us a, a, a chance to respond to God, each of us individually, privately with him. So would you stand with me to your feet? If you're watching online, you can just bow your head and close your eyes right there online. Before you guys do that, before you, before you close your eyes real quick, I, I wanna say one more thing to you. Before we enter into this, this time of decision, I wanna say one more thing to you. If you hear this message and you choose to not give financially, if you hear this message and you can't give financially, I want you to know you are always welcome here 
it does not matter what you give or if you give, we will always love you. We will always love your family. We will always fight for the best for your kids and for your marriage. Man, what you give has, has no bearing on your uh, relationship with God or your standing in this church, okay? You are free from that. We give from a place of being so grateful for what God has done for us. That's it. Okay, so with that being our mindset, let's go to God into a time of decision. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes to give privacy to the people around you? If you're here and maybe this is the first time you've really had clarity on who Jesus is, you don't have to have your life cleaned up. You don't have to have the Bible memorized, none of that. You just gotta be ready to say yes to forgiveness, yes to grace, and yes to following Jesus. And if that's the decision you wanna to make today to become a Christian, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three as a private decision between you and God. One, two, three. That's incredible. That's so beautiful. Awesome, you can put your hand down. Keep your heads bowed and eyes closed, but church, can we celebrate the fact that someone just gave their life to Jesus? It's a beautiful thing. For the rest of us, I think God is calling you to get serious and get real about helping people experience freedom. But we gotta understand that freedom comes at a cost. And so if you're willing to say, Jesus, whatever you ask of me, I'm in. Freedom is worth everything. And Jesus, I'll give you my time, I'll give you my resources, I'll give you whatever you ask of me. Whatever it is, Jesus, I'm in. If you wanna make that kind of commitment to say, Jesus, I believe freedom is worth everything. If that's the declaration you wanna make before God today, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. It's beautiful, hands up all over the room. It's incredible, keep your hands up, let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. We ask you to do this in us. Jesus, we need you to root out selfishness in us. We need you to root out greed in us. We need you to free us from all of that. But God, bigger than that, we want you to use us to set people free. We want you to use us to spread your hope and your love all across this city. And so Jesus, do that work inside of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray together by saying, amen, let's go. Thank you so much for joining us for this Peak City message today. If you'd like more information on Peak City Church or if you'd like to give to the mission here in Colorado Springs, then check us out at peakcityco.com.